Alright, so uh, last time we talked about the uh, incompressible hybrid, hybrid elastic isotropic chain energy potential functions. These energy potential functions are used uh, to find the relationship between the stress and the strain for uh, large deformation elastic materials. The, the ones we introduced last time were used for the incompressible material. Today we're going to talk about the ones used for uh, compressible materials. So, as we talked about last time, it's uh, to find such, or, or the model for such functions, can have a form like this. The, the energy function is equal to a certain function of lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 minus 3 and you can raise it to any power you want and maybe add uh, uh, terms like this with different powers such term would be a function of the stretch in each direction another function could be in the change of area in each direction Lambda 1, lambda 2 gives me the change in area uh, on the, the change in area perpendicular to the third stretch. Lambda 1, lambda 3 gives me the change in area perpendicular to the second stretch. Plus lambda 2, lambda 3. Again, minus 3, so that the minimum would be uh, when all of these are equal to 1, and raise it to a power of equal. Beta, for example, according to or, or add different terms to make it a nonlinear material. And another function of lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 minus 1. And so on. So this last function makes sure that in the energy there's a term that has to do with the change in volume. This term would be equal to zero if there's no one inch change. Lambda one, lambda two, lambda three. If the three lambdas are equal to one, and so any form like this would work. And all you have to do is take it to the lab and find, propose a certain form for the function f, for the function g, for the function h. Take it to the lab, do some experiments, and find the material constants that appear in that form. Now. Uh, the, the form there's the form that's mostly used in uh, uh, that you're going to find in the literature decomposes this energy into two terms: the term for uh, the change in volume and a term for the change in shape. So we already know that F, the deformation gradient, is equal to a rotation matrix multiplied by the stretches or the diagonal matrix of the stretches multiplied by another rotation matrix Q transpose. Now I'm going to decompose this F into the vol. I'm going to write F like this. This matrix P. Instead of lambda 1, I'm going to put lambda 1 over lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, power 1 over 3. Similarly, lambda 2 over j, power 1 over 3. j is the determinant of f, which is equal to lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. And similarly, lambda 3 over j, power 1 over 3. Q transpose multiplied by j power 1 over 3 i. An extra matrix at the end. And I'm going to call this term f bar and this 
Mr. I'll just leave it as G R one over three R. You can see I haven't done anything because the determinant of f is equal to j and the determinant of f prime, you'll find it's equal to uh, 1 and the determinant of f prime, j, 1 over 3i, will be equal to g. I'm going to say that W is equal to two terms. Function of F bar plus function of G. There are many examples, so examples of such functions, and they're the ones, actually, if you're doing any finite element analysis modeling using abacus, these are the functions that actually appear in the software. So the first, uh, now, maybe before we jump to the examples, let's just talk about the first invariant of f bar transpose f. The first invariant of f bar transpose f will be equal to lambda 1 bar squared plus lambda 2 bar squared plus lambda 3 bar squared for lambda bar i equal to lambda i divided by lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, bar 1 over 3. I is the second invariant of f bar transpose f bar will be equal to lambda 1 bar squared lambda, lambda 2 bar squared Third, third invariant of f transpose f, which is equal to lambda 1 bar, lambda 2 bar, lambda 3 bar, will be equal to lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, divided by lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, power 1 with 3, power 3, equal to 1. And now I can write w as a function, I1 of F transpose F bar, another function of I2, the second invariant of F bar transpose F bar, plus another function of lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, which is basically G. And the forms that are available are the Mooney 
Caribbean material model. Has the form W is equal to C10, the material constants I1. I'm just going to read these bars just to differentiate them from the previous ones, and then we started in the previous lecture. So I1 minus 3. I1 minus 3 is basically lambda 1 squared, lambda 1 bar squared, lambda 2 bar squared, lambda 3 bar 3, lambda bar 3 squared. Plus another material constant multiplied by I2 bar minus 3, plus another material constant multiplied by J minus 1 squared. Now if you know that the material abides by the Moody Riverland material model, and if you know its behavior under small deformation by knowing, for example, E and Young's modulus, if E and Young's modulus under small deformations are known, this to calibrate these C10, C01, and D1 by the shear modulus is equal to 2 over D1. The bulk, sorry, the bulk modulus is equal to 2 over D1, and the shear modulus is equal to 2 C10 plus C01. So if I know E and Poisson's ratio and K and G, you can have estimates for D1, C10, and C01 to start with. Another material model is the neo -Hookian. material model. And the energy. I1 minus 3, the general constant multiplied I1 minus 3 plus 1 over D1 J minus 1 squared. And again, if you know E and Poisson's ratio, then the relationship is K under small deformations. K is equal to 2 over D1, so you can find estimate for D1 and G is equal to 2 C10. Another material model. So there are two other material models. You can look at them if you ever need them, but for the assignment so or for any uh, work that I will ask you will be the first two material models, but of course if you were doing work on hyperelastic materials, you would be interested to see all the different material models available for such materials. So there are two other material models. One is called the Ogden material model, and another one called the polynomial form. There are so many other material models existing in the literature, especially all these are for uh, uh, isotropic materials. The behavior is just function of lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, independent of any rotation. There are different other materials, especially if you have a special direction that has fibers in a large elastic or in a hyperelastic material, then the, this energy function would be a little bit slightly even more complicated than this. Okay, so let's uh, uh, show an example. So basically, I would like to see what is the stress strain relationship of these materials. Just if I take a, a piece of this material in the lab and I stretch it, what is the relationship between uh, the force or the, the relationship between the engineering stress and the engineering, or, and, and the engineering strain, for example? 
And the relationship, I'll just give you the shape. If I look at the engineering stress P11, which is the first view of the Kirchhoff stress P11, and if I look versus lambda 1, which is L over L0, and you get, if it's a linear elastic, we know that you get this straight line. If you have a new hook in the material, you get this line, you get this curve. And it, if you have a moon derivative material, you get this group. Now, the, I just want to redraw or find these groups. How would I find these groups? So, uh, we need to draw the relationship between the component P11, the first P electric of stress, and lambda 1 in a uniaxial state of stress using the three material models, linear elastic, compressible near Hokkien, and compressible moon derivative material models. Now for the linear elastic, we already know Young's model sample sounds ratio. Assume that the material is isotropic and no rotations occur during deformation. No rotations occur during deformation, so F basically is equal to lambda 1, 0, 0, 0, lambda 2, 0, 0, 0, lambda 3, which makes life very easy because lambda 1 is equal to F11 one one, and lambda 2 is equal to F22 two two, and lambda 3 is equal to F33. Three three. Now it's a uniaxial state of stress, which means that the first view of the stress, P110, just it's given. So I would like to draw the relationship between this and this. So what is the material model? Let's look at the. Uh, we have Young's modulus and Masson's ratio. This is the, the both modulus and this is the shear modulus. I can find. So let's say the new hooking material. The strain energy function is equal to C one zero I one bar minus three plus one over. I know G, I know C is 0, and 2 over D1 is equal to K, so I know K, I can find D1, so I know these numbers, these are basically material constants, MPA, and so this is C10, I bar 1 is equal to lambda 1 over lambda 1, lambda 2, actually I1 bar is equal to lambda 1 squared plus lambda 2 squared plus lambda 3 squared minus 3 plus 1 over z1 lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 minus 1 squared. P11 is equal to partial W by partial F11. But F11 is equal to lambda 1, so this is equal to partial W by partial lambda 1. And I should have multiplied partial lambda 1 by partial F11 plus partial W by partial lambda 2, partial lambda 2 by partial F11, and so on. But all these are zeros. And I'm only left with partial W by partial lambda 1. Now this is a large 
expression in lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. Basically, if you take the first derivative of this energy with respect to lambda 1, you get a huge expression in lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3. P22 is equal to partial lambda partial lambda 2. Again, large expression in this. P33 is equal to partial lambda by like partial lambda 3. Again, large expression in lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. Now, I would like to draw the relationship between P11 and lambda 1. So, how would I do this? I need to find the three stretches. Lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3. To find the three stretches, first, so I need to know. So, first, assume lambda 1, let's say 1.01. After you assume lambda 1, you know that two equations, P22 is equal to 0, P33 equal to 0, two equations. Two nonlinear equations in lambda two and lambda three. Solve them using the Newton axiom or any method that you want. Find lambda two and lambda three. After you find lambda two and lambda three, you know everything that you want because you know lambda two and lambda three. You know them all, you can find P11, therefore P11 is known, W is known, J is known, everything is known. Then, lambda 1 is equal to 1.02, repeat, and so on. And you get these nice groups. Depending on what value of lambda 1, you get a value for P11. And you might want to check, if you want, what sigma 1 versus lambda 1 look like. This is the engineering stress, P11. You might want to look what the Cauchy stress, sigma 1, look like. Now, you know that you can create sig sigma is equal to a function. I don't remember exactly the function, but it has to do with the e. sigma and p are related with <coughs> f. And we know f. Okay. So th these material models are very useful for large deformation elasticity, and if you uh, are taking the FEA course, we're going to we're going to repeat this again. We're just going to say the same thing again in the next lecture. But we're going to use these material models to see how I can take a ball and, and really squish it, or or really apply really large deformations to it. If, when when I use the linear elastic material model, it fails at large deformations. I'm not able to deform an object too much. You can't really apply it to rubber. When I use those material models, I'm able to deform objects to have apply really high levels of deformations to rubber materials. So in your assignment, you're required to find the stresses given a certain states of strain for using the Moon derivative material model and the neo Hookian material model. And one of those is a shear deformation. Now for a shear deformation, just assume that F is equal to 1 alpha 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Don't put 10 theta if you're utilizing Mathematica. If you put 10 theta, you get, I mean, if you can, you put 10 theta, but you're going to get a huge. Yeah. yeah, we saw it and we didn't come up with the final result for the assignment. That's fine. I'll take that in consideration. Uh, but if you put alpha, that, that's fine. You just can make it as a function of alpha, where alpha is a positive number. When I started drawing alpha, it wasn't. <laughs> what? 
we're, we're, we're gonna try. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll post this solution. But if, whenever you're doing anything, just it worked for you? With 10 beta. With 10 beta. Until it looks neat. Okay, yeah. The, the, you, the, the only, because Mathematica, the, the issue is you have to, you have to tell Mathematica that alpha is a positive number. Because it's not positive, then it might appear under the square root, and then because it's, it's, it doesn't have a numerical value, it might assume that it's a it's a complex, it's, it's a negative number. How because can, it, how can do that? Yeah. There's a depending on what function you're using, but there's assuming alpha is greater than zero, do something. But not everything works here, so I'll post the solution. No, no, yeah. <coughs> Or do it by hand. I, I mean, <laughs> it, yeah. Okay. So, the, so for the, the rest of, of today's lecture, it's it will be kind of a revision for everything that we studied for six six five. Uh, but we're just going to talk about the principle of virtual work and we're at the end we're going to talk about the uh, different methods, numerical methods that we can use to find the approximate solutions for the differential equations of equilibrium. And uh, you're also asked to solve assignment number two, which is uh, exactly similar to assignment one in six six five. So again another easy week for you and we're starting we're going to start plasticity next week so let's talk about the principle of virtual work for uh, principle of virtual work for a mass spring system so from equilibrium if I have uh, Unit, the, the one dimensional system made out of the spring and mass, then at equilibrium, I know that the force in the spring is equal to mg. Now, since f is equal to mg at equilibrium, or f minus g is equal to zero, I can take this is equivalent to saying for every A belongs to R, F minus MG A is equal to zero. These two equations in front of you are equivalent. As you remember, we did something like this in the midterm where we said P dot Q or P dot U is equal to U not U for every U, that will ensure that P is equal to Q. And also if I tell you that P dot U is equal to zero for every U, that will ensure that P has to be zero. And so if I tell you that for every A, any real number, F minus MG multiplied by A is equal to zero, that will ensure that F minus MG is equal to zero. Because I can assume anything for A, I can assume it F minus MG. F minus MG squared is zero, F minus MG is zero. Now, I'm going to add a little bit of physics to it. Instead of saying for every real number A, I'm going to call it for every displacement U star. F minus MG U star is equal to zero. Now, when I add this, all of a sudden I can replace a mathematical constant with a physical constant. And the physical constant st states, from equilibrium, F U star minus MG U star equals zero, or F U star is equal to MG U star. What's the, what's the physical constant? This is the internal virtual 
is equal to the external virtual world. The internal virtual world is the work or the amount of, of, of energy, additional energy stored inside the screen when I stretch it by <coughs> an additional uh, delta star. Now delta star is actually this distance. If I add delta star to whatever I have already, which is delta, then I increase the energy by F multiplied by delta star. And if I, and the external work, virtual work is equal to the force multiplied by the displacement, which is mg multiplied by delta star. Now, the same principle applies for a continuum. So let's now do the equations for a continuum. The equations for a continuum state the following. Departure, say, 1, 1. Departure, x1. Plus departure, sigma, 2, 1. Departure, x2. I have it written here. partial sigma 3 1 partial x3 plus rho b1 is equal to 0 and another equation is equal to 0 and a third equation is equal to 0 as well now what I'm going to do is this is true for any real for every real number, I'm going to call it the real number 1 in R, this is true. For every real number, another real number in R, this is true. For every real number in R, this is true. In fact, this is even true if I add all the above. So I'm just going to utilize the uh, summation convention because it will make my life easier. This is one equation, which is basically the sum. Here I have the sum, i, j equal 1 to 3. Which is basically summing all the three equations. Now, if this equation is equivalent to the above, because we're saying for every u1 star, for every u2 star, for every u3 star, I have the sum of this term plus this term plus this term is 0. Because we're saying this is true for every u1 star, u2 star, u3 star, then you can assume anything for u2 and u3, 0 and 0, then you get the first equation is equal to 0. If you assume anything for, if you assume 1 or 0, 0, 1, you get the third equation. If you assume 0, 1, 0, you get the second equation. So this one equation, because I said for every u star, because I said this, it makes the two equations equivalent. If I don't say this, then this is not true. They're only equivalent because I say this is true for every u star. So I can, so this is equivalent to the equation this is equal to zero, this is equal to zero, and the third equilibrium equation. Now this is even true If I integrate over the volume, it will still be equal to zero. I'm going to add partial sigma j i by partial x j 
du i star plus rho will be i du i star integrated over the volume of the other. This is still equal to zero. I'm integrating zero, so I'm still getting a zero. Now from here, I'm going to just do a little bit of small manipulation, similar to what we did in the Galerki method, to prove or to show that the internal virtual work is equal to the external virtual work. Right now I have this as what we call external virtual work by body forces. Rho B, the body forces acting on the object, multiplied by a vector. That's space with vector u1, u2, u3, so this is the dot product. And so this is equal to the external virtual work by the body forces rho B. Now I want to play with this term a little bit, so I'm going to take, take it up here. Partial sigma j i, like partial x j. U i star is equal to partial sigma j i. U i star by partial x j minus sigma j i partial u star i by partial x j. Sigma j i is equal to sigma i j. So I'm going to put this as sigma i j. This is a symmetric matrix. And it's a symmetric matrix. This is the trace. It's snowing outside. Man. I didn't want to come. <laughs> so sigma i j multiplied by partial u star i by partial x j plus partial u j by star by partial x i divided by j. Since the stress matrix is symmetric, I can do this. And now I'm going to take, I hope you can see what I'm trying to do here. Now I'm going to take this, or basically, I, I already have this as that one, so I'm going to replace it with separate all these, dv, minus this, so I'm going to put it on the other side, so here plus rho bi plus u i star dv. I'm going to put this on the other side, so sigma ij. And what is this? Partial u star, like partial xj plus partial uj star by function x i divided by 2. If you remember, this is the strain, associated strain, star i j. The virtual strain, or the strain associated with y. And you 
is even a divergence. Clear? Partial this variable with respect to x k is equal to this variable, sigma g i, u i star, n g, integrated for the surface. Sigma j i and j u s i star is equal to u star dot t n, which is sigma transpose n, integrated with what in the surface, plus rho b dot u star, integrated with the volume, is equal to sigma i j epsilon star i j. And we obtain what we're looking for, which is the internal virtual work associated with any displacement field is equal to the external virtual work associated with any additional uh, the displacement field you start. Now, once I say this is true for every U star, for any vector U star, that's of course it has to be smooth so that I can take the derivative. When I say for every U star that is smooth, external virtual work is equal to the internal virtual work, I basically am saying, this is equivalent to saying that the sum of forces is equal to three. So the virtual work principle is an integral form of the equilibrium equations. It's exactly the same thing. But only it's, a, it, it's only the same thing because I'm saying this is true for every U star. If it's true for only one but not true for another, that doesn't mean that the equilibrium equations are satisfied. Now, then you have an illustrative example. This is the, the, the function of the illustrative example is just to make you understand what all these things are. stress, so I already know the stresses, and we're applying a horizontal displacement field u to star, a vertical, a virtual vertical displacement field u to star, and just verify that this is true. <coughs> is the internal virtual work equal to the external virtual work in this case, and is it in the, in that for when, when u star is equal to this, and is it true when u star is equal to this, and they should. And so you're going to find, now first, uh, you'll find that rho b is equal to zero using the, the equilibrium equations. <coughs> now for the first virtual displacement, u star is equal to ax1, where a is a number, zero, zero epsilon star is equal to a zero 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 so I have the, the internal virtual work will be equal to sigma one one epsilon one one star integrated over dx one integrated over dx two integrated over dx three The external virtual work is equal to rho b dot u star is equal to zero uh, so plus tn dot u star ds. Now for this example, this is zero. 
some, in your assignment, you're asking me the same thing, but this is not zero. So x2 on the side varies from 0 to 1. x1 is always equal to 2. So x2, 5, 5, 2, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. So the, tra the, the stress on this side is equal to x2, 5, 0. So basically, the stress on the side looks like this. Horizontal, I have x2. Pressure. And vertically, I have a shear of pi. Just for illustration, just to explain what you see, what's x2 file is. Now u star on n1, the virtual displacement on n1, is equal to ax1 a multiplied by 2, 0, 0. And so the external virtual work on 1 is equal to the integral of tn1 dot u star integrated over the length dx2 integrated over dx3 dx2 goes from 0 to 1 and dx3 is 0 from the thickness to the thickness of the plate t n1 is equal to this u n star u star n1 is equal to this so when you take the dot product, I'm left with 2a x2 integrated over dx2 integrated over dx3. This is equal to 2a x2 squared divided by 2, which is 1 divided by 2 t equal to 8. So you're going to do this four more times and then verify that indeed the internal virtual work is equal to the external virtual work. principle, we're going to take the same principle, we're going to do the same thing, but apply it for beams. 
And for beams, the, the beams have only one variable function, which is y. y uh, is basically the y. And so the virtual displacement is basically y star, which is a movement from the equilibrium position, an additional displacement field called y star. Now again, the equilibrium equation is vi, d for y by dx1 r4 is equal to q. Now this is true for every y star in r. Assuming y star is a continuous and smooth function, I can integrate this external virtual work by Q. I'm still missing the external virtual work by the boundary forces. The boundary forces are V1, V2, M1, M2. And I'm still missing the internal virtual work done by the stresses. So I'm going to take this term and manipulate it again using the uh, calculus and using the following, the integral. F1, F2, sorry, F1, F2 on the boundary is equal to the integral of Df1, Df2 is equal to the integral of, of, of F1, Df2 plus the integral of F2, Df1. I'm going to apply this to this term. I'm going to put here shear. Multiply by the displacement on the boundary. This is the external virtual work due to uh, the shear on the boundary. This is the shear on the boundary. And this is the displacement on the boundary. This is F1, this is F2. So Vi e to be Y by dx1 q multiplied by D by star dx1 dx1 plus the integral of F2, F2 is Vi. E is y star. Df1 is Ei, fourth derivative of y, with respect to x1 and fourth, dx1. And so you can recognize that this term is equal to this term. And so I can replace it with the shear on the boundary plus this or minus this term. This is equal to V1 multiplied by Y1 star minus V2 multiplied by Y2 star. And so you're going to do this and then repeat again.
final equations will be the integration of EI d to y by dx1 squared multiplied by the second derivative of that virtual displacement that we're applying integrated over the length. This is equal to the internal virtual work. Internal virtual work, this is the moment. This is the second derivative of that displacement that we applied. Is equal to the integral of q y star integrated over the length plus v1 y1 star minus v2 y2 star minus m1 theta 1 star plus m2 theta 2 star. And what are all these values? This is the external virtual work provided by Q and the shears at the ends and the moments at the ends. Shear v2 multiplied by y2 star, v1 multiplied by y1 star, m1 multiplied by theta 1 star, m2 multiplied by theta 2 star. Whenever they're in the same direction, it's positive. Whenever they're in the negative, opposite directions, the external virtual work is negative. And once we say true for every y star, true for every y star, then both this equation and the equilibrium equation are equivalent. This is true for every y star, makes the two equations equivalent. If I don't say this is true for every y star, then they're not equivalent. They're only equivalent because I say this is true for every y star. So again, just a simple illustrative example. I would be uh, simply support B. It has a reaction here, a reaction here, a horizontal reaction here. RH has a load of negative 5x1 assuming that the Young's model is the length and the moment of inertia for the beam are EL and I verify that the principle of virtual work applies when a virtual cubic displacement by star is applied to the beam. So y star is equal to a x1 squared x1 minus l. A virtual displacement. I just want to make sure that the integral of ei d to y by dx1 squared multiplied by d to y star by dx1 squared dx1. This integral. So y. So you need to find the displacement. Of, of this beam, to find the displacement of the beam. Now we need to verify that this has to be equal to Q, which is equal to negative 5 times 1, multiplied by y star integrated over the length. Now I have the moments are 0. plus n reactions virtual work and the nice thing about the displacement that is here is that the displacement on, at the end is zero and so this will also be equal to zero the 
original word for it, the machine uh, Again, I don't, I'm not going to ask her about anything that has to do with the machine Khabib in any exams. Basically, in the term of Shinkobi, the internal virtual work has two tricks. One for the shared information, and one for the bending deformation. The internal virtual work, because now I have two stresses and two stresses. Like, in the order of no beam, I only have sigma on one. In Euler, let's, let's just clarify this. In Euler, Renaud B, the stress has sigma on one, sigma on two, sigma on two, zero, all zeros, but the strain has only epsilon one. In a Timoshenko B, the stress sigma on 1, sigma on 2, sigma on 2, 0, 0, 0, 0. And the stream actually has epsilon on 1 and has epsilon on 2. And so the virtual work has two terms. One due to sigma on 1, which is usually due to bending, and one due to sigma on 2, which is the shear difference. Okay, so I will give you five minutes and then we'll talk about the applications of the virtual form.